Welcome back. Um, just a few more words about Naive Base and then we'll move on to hidden macro models. Um, I think some of you, maybe most of you, have struggled with Naive Base uh, over the weekend, uh, which was just the right thing to do. Uh, there are all these pesky little details and figuring out on your own what to do with them or realizing that there's an issue there um, is, is actually, I, I was going to say it's part of the learning process, but I should say it's the learning process. Um, so it actually worked out well in other assignments too, where I gave you the basic idea you had to work on the assignment and we came back and discussed it. I'm beginning to like that. We might start doing it on purpose. Um, regarding uh, Naive Base, uh, the main questions that came up on uh, Piazza had to do with vocabulary, which vocabulary to use, what to do with new words, words that never occurred before. Um, so let me go back to where I took a break, which is the um, smoothing estimation of um, the probability of individual words and individual topic based on the data. And there's a specific word here, uh, given a topic or given a label in more general, since they're not exactly always topics. And we start with counts, count of the number of times this word occurred uh, with this label and divided by the number of times words occurred um, all words occurred in the label This is what's called the relative frequency estimator, which is also the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, and we said this is a problem if the numerator is zero. And why is this a problem? It's a specific problem in a naive base setting because in a naive base setting you have a product of things like this. And if one of them is zero, the entire product is zero. The practical implication of that is that if you estimate the probability of a certain word occurring in a certain topic or label as zero, if it occurs, you automatically exclude that label from consideration. So it's as if you're saying, since uh, if I've never seen the word basketball in a set of sports document, then if I see the word basketball, it's not a sports document, which is of course silly, right? You're going to see new words in the context of uh, any, any topic or any um, label. So um, we're going to smooth that. First, we're going to ask, what is this summation here over? Are you looking at individual vocabularies for the different topics? The answer is no. You want to look at uh, one vocabulary for all of them for several reasons. One is, this is how you're going to get the zeros. Uh, the second one is, uh, if you're going to have a probabilistic interpretation of what we're doing here, you have to have a well-defined common event space. Probabilities are defined relative to event spaces. And the event space that you're going to define that's going to be common for all the topics is all the words that occurred in all, in all of your documents, in all of your topics. I'm not saying anything that's new to somebody who's struggled with this over the weekend, but since I think your deadline is tomorrow night, if you haven't struggled with it, or if you are still struggling with it. Um, so this is over the entire vocabulary. The second thing is, I cleverly didn't leave myself enough room here. Um, hmm. Poor people over there don't see anything anymore. All right, I'll copy it over here.
Now we're going to use our pseudo count mechanism, and we talked about it in great depth, uh, what it really means. I think the example I may have given in class was one here, or just in general put a K here. Um, a fixed count, pseudo count for each possible word. Um, you don't have to. If you have reason to believe that some words are more common than others, you can put a larger pseudo count. Uh, another way to formulate it is as in Mitchell's book, not as a count, but as a whole probability distribution already normalized. It's equivalent, that's what he calls the M method, which is I think what you're using in your assignment. Um, and now we want to normalize it here if this is just a fixed count, which is effectively means interpolation with a uniform, well not interpolation, but combination with a uniform, um, then we need to have a count here and the size of your total vocabulary here. The next question that was asked was what to do with words that have never occurred in any of the um, topics or documents. It's important because they're going to show up in a new test document, right? I mean, it's in the nature of language that we are constantly seeing new, um, new events, new words, even after we saw a very, very large corpus. In fact, we'll always continue to see them. Um, the simplest thing we could do is ignore it. So pre-process your document to eliminate uh, words that have never been seen before in your training data. Um, the argument for that would be that a word that was never seen in any one of the topics doesn't give any preferential information for one topic over another. So it's as if, um, from an information theory point of view, the mutual information between the occurrence of that word and the topic is zero. If that's the case, you can just toss it as if it didn't exist. Uh, it's not completely true. Some topics may be more open vocabulary than others, may be more prone to getting new words than others for a variety of reasons. It could be because some of the topics, if now we're talking about topic classification or just a generic label, um, in some, some topics you may have much more data than other topics. As you get more and more data, the rate at which you see new words goes down. If you only saw a handful of documents, then maybe every tenth word is going to be new. If you saw a million documents, then maybe only one in every hundred words would be new. It's a very well-known phenomena uh, in language, but in other areas as well. So it could happen because there is an imbalance in the training data and some topics are more, better trained than others and therefore the rate, what we call the novelty rate, which is basically the probability that the next word you see in a particular topic is uh, new. Next word is new, was never seen in that topic. So if you see a word that was never seen but in any of the topics, it may be more surprising to some topics than to others. Or alternatively, it may indicate some preference for some topics over others. To deal with that problem would take a little bit more work, but you can imagine estimating this probability of next word being new as a condition on your topic or on your label. And using that as another feature. I'm not asking you to do it in your assignment, but keep in mind that this, is, this could be actually an informative feature. Um, I, I mentioned one reason why uh, the rate of novelty might be different between different topics, because they, you might have a different amount of training data, but there are other reasons. Some topics are inherently more open-ended, more open class than others. If you're discussing, I don't know if it's a good example, but if you're discussing sports, once you've listed all the teams and all the terms to do with the teams and all the players in this season, then maybe it's just things rehashing themselves, there's nothing new, uh, all the words are gonna be the same more or less. If you're discussing 
Um, earthquakes, then if, uh, if, they are, if they happen to happen um, near little towns all over the world, then you know, there are so many little towns uh, that you're more likely to see the name of a new town that you've never seen before. Uh, kind of a lame example, but uh, you can probably think of other, other examples. There are certainly languages, sub-languages, that are smaller in terms of vocabulary usage than others. Um, all right, here's a better example. If you're trying to distinguish written documents from transcription of spoken language. So you're, you're getting a, a quote-unquote document, a sequence of words, and you're trying to automatically determine whether it was originally written as written English or whether it was originally spoken and somebody transcribed it. It's a well-known fact that when people speak, they use a far less rich vocabulary than when they write. Their working set is much smaller than when they write. Written English, at least, you know, well-educated or, uh, say, top newspaper written English, is going to use a larger variety of words. As a result, the probability of novelty there is going to be higher. So there, especially if the topics that they're discussing are the same, there the probability of novelty may, be, may very well be the distinguishing feature. That and maybe the length of the sentence and the complexity of the sentence. So naive base is very nice for topic detection because it's a very easy problem. Um, but for other problems, uh, you need to think of other features of the document, such as novelty, sentence length, question. So would you use like novelty rate and the uh, class stuff? Well? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I will start. I will use novelty rate uh, in two stages. First stage is estimating the novelty rate, and the second one is using it. The using it could be done the same way as I use uh, any other occurrence, any other feature. Um, the estimating it is the tricky part that I skipped over. Let me just tell you why it's tricky. If you're asking yourself, how many times did a word occur that, have, that has never occurred, that's kind of a silly question, right? But if you ask yourself, how many times did a word occur that occurred, it was the first time I saw it, that's not so silly. Now you can, so you can kind of substitute the number of times that a word occurred for the first time uh, for the novelty rate, more or less. Any other questions that came up over the weekend? Oh, I'm trying to think. Yeah. Yes, I have a more general question. Uh -huh. So I heard um, for natural language processing in general and text mining, uh, obviously one way in which we are learning is name based. Um, some people have also suggested using linear regression. So uh, with like weights for the categories and then trying to train it based on the weights or something like that. So when when uh, is it appropriate to use either of the methods? Like with which scenarios, I guess? Linear regression. So, linear regression would give you a number, right? And you're looking for a multi-way classification here. So one way in which um, I could kind of tie together, I'm not sure you mean but linear regression, is going back to uh, Ronald Fisher, he came up with a method called linear discriminant analysis. And linear discriminant analysis, um, and it's funny and it's confusing because it's also LDA, like latent to richly allocation. So let me, let me describe both. Um, linear or analysis, also known as LDA. And um, Latent Dirichlet allocation. Also known as LDA. Drive statisticians crazy because LDA has been around for a hundred years, and then come these machine learning wannabes and they take something else and they call it LDA. Um, 
They mean completely different things. They're both relevant here, by the way. So what you are saying, maybe, I'm trying to make sense of it, maybe corresponds to this. And the idea there is, uh, suppose I describe all the feature, the feature space in two dimensions. Uh, so remember, it's not two-dimensional, it's hundred, uh, you know, thousand-dimensional, as many as large as your vocabulary. But let's say it was two-dimensional. The idea then is that you come up with a um, linear combination of them, so you pass a linear separator um, for each one of the topics that you're considering. So this would be topic one, and this would be topic two, and this would be topic three. There could be as many as you want. And then for a given point, you measure its distance to the line. Uh, and the one with the lowest is that. That sounds like that's what you had in mind. Uh, and the one with the shortest distance would, would be the winner. Um, this corresponds to a, an assumption of uh, a particular assumption of noise uh, on the covariates. So as if they come from a, a certain topic and then they have a, 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 a particular, I think, I think it's always Gaussian distribution of noise. Um, yeah, I have not seen LDA, that kind of LDA being used for topic classification much. I, I don't know what, um, it makes a lot of sense for a small number of dimensions and very heterogeneous features. I don't know about topic classification. Let me tell you about latent Dirichlet allocation. The Dirichlet allocation actually does make a lot of sense for topic classification. And it actually improves over naive base often. Um, in latent Dirichlet allocation, we assume that the topics, it's, it's for a different, slightly different setup when the topics are not given to you, but you're trying to induce the topics as well as the classification itself. So you're assuming that there is some number of topics, and each topic is associated with a set of, a set of um, words. The second thing you're assuming is that any one document is not necessarily purely in one topic. So every document is a combination of multiple topics, which is actually a much more reasonable assumption than naive base, in the sense that um, in reality, you know, if you come up with a set of a small set of topics, uh, any document could discuss multiple of them. So um, it's a harder model to learn because it has latent components, namely components that you cannot are not labeled for you during the training process, uh, but it is more expressive. It can it can express finer distinctions than naive base. Naive base is sort of the simplest vanilla. Thing that you can do, and, and for topic uh, classification, it's usually enough. It's, uh, topic classification is an easy problem. You can get it just about any method you try. Uh, yeah? Um, about the formula, like, um, <coughs> uh, like we have to the 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 uh -huh. and uh, when the k becomes zero, that means we, we don't do smoothing. Right. Right, I, I thought I'd try to cover that now. So when there's a new word that is not, um, have not been seen in any topic, the simplest pragmatic thing you can do is just ignore it. But in this case, you just deny the you do what? I'm sorry? You just think that the new word has no contribution to the um, Well, yeah, I discussed that earlier now. So the simplest assumption is that a new word does not, does not favor one topic over the other. If you believe the new word does favor some topics over others, you need to first estimate the probability of seeing a new word in each one of the topics. That's what we call the novelty rate. Um, and the second thing you need to do is when you have your new document, you see a word you've never seen before, convert it into the word novelty, okay? So think of the word novelty as a word outside, or, or it's not a word, it's a separate, we sometimes call it the OOV word, out of vocabulary word. Take, take the string, it has brackets to remind you this is not a real word, so it's not something that actually occurred, but it's, consider it a word in your vocabulary. 
and any word that is not one of the other words that you've ever seen convert it into this word. Now you need to estimate the probability of that word in each one of your documents. That's a little tricky. I mentioned it earlier, but we'll leave it there. All right, shall we move on? Okay, so we're talking about hidden Markov models. Let's first talk about just Markov models. So I'd like to tell a little story. Imagine that you have an office at CMU that you come to every morning. Uh, and imagine that you live far away, let's say in Monroeville. How many of you know where Monroeville is? Okay. So if you recall, well, to get from Monroeville to CMU, you typically have to pass through a tunnel, Squirrel Hill Tunnel. Let us assume that um, Every morning you drive your car from Monroeville to CMU um, and you typically pass through the tunnel. That tunnel, as you well know, living in Pittsburgh, is subject to repairs. So it's not always open. Most of the time it's open. But on occasion um, it is semi-open only. It has only one lane in each direction because they're fixing the other direction. And on even more rare occasions, it's closed completely. In which case, you have to take a detour. So, um, you being a nerd, you keep statistics of uh, the state of the tunnel um, over a long period of time, let's say a year. So, state of the tunnel It could be open, semi-open, which I'll just call semi or closed. You keep track of it every day of the year, and by the way, you go to work on the weekend too. This is CMU after all, so you have 365 um, days in the year, and now you can estimate the probability, estimate hat, probability of the state being open. as the number of times it was open over the total number amount of data you had, right? Uh, this is the relative frequency estimate. It is also the maximum likelihood estimate, as I showed you with an example of flipping a coin. Um, you do that for all three states. Then you notice something peculiar. Um, maybe it's not so peculiar. When the tunnel is semi-open one day, the probability it will be semi-open the next day is significantly elevated. This is, of course, because repairs typically take more than one day. So you start paying attention not only to the overall prevalence, the overall frequency of the state of, of each possible state, but to how they affect each other, one after the other. And you build a little model that says, Let's say the state of a tunnel would be, and on day uh, T would be QT, QT, state of tunnel on day T. You build a model that asks what is the probability of the state of a tunnel at day T conditioned on its state on the first day of the year, it stayed on the second day of the year, all the way to QT minus one. Now this is complicated. This is a very, it could be a very long list. And the state of each one of these could be anything, any one of three states. So there are three to the T minus one possible conditioners here. You can't possibly estimate them all. You don't have enough data. You're gonna make a simplifying assumption. 
The simplifying assumption we're going to make is that the state of a tunnel on any one day depends only on the state of the tunnel the day before. Is it a correct assumption? Probably not. Is it a reasonable approximation? Probably. Could you insist on making it dependent on the state of the tunnel not only the day before, but the day before that too? Yeah, you could. We're going to make the simpler assumption that this is equal to the state of the tunnel at time t conditioned only on the state of the tunnel at time t minus 1. This assumption is called the first order Markov assumption. Um, as you may guess, the second order Markov assumption is the assumption that it depends on the last two days, t minus 1 and t minus 2. Third order Markov assumption, four order Markov assumption. What's the zero order Markov assumption? It's independent. Every day there's a, uh, a um, distribution that does not depend on the previous day. This, kind of, uh, this is the, or the assumption and the model is called the first order Markov model. No hidden, nothing is hidden yet. First order Markov model. In general, the Markovian assumption is the assumption that the future state of a system depends on only a finite amount of the past. Which is an extremely useful assumption because if it's a finite amount of the past then there are only so many possible values, a finite number of possible values of the past on which it differs. Uh, in the simplest case of first order Markov assumption, that means it only depends on one thing that could be one of three values. And it's very easy to draw. So let me draw here the state of the tunnel, open, semi-open, and close, closed. These are the states. And I can depict the, the way the system or the state of the world or the state of the tunnel transitions over time with arrows between them. So I can say if on one day the tunnel is open, the next day it could remain open. Or it could become semi-closed or it could become closed. So these are the three possibilities, but they're not equally likely. If today the tunnel is open, I suspect that 90% chance it'll be open tomorrow too. So I will put a 0 0.9 here. There's maybe an 8% chance it'll be semi-open. That's the more likely of the two events. So it'll be 0 0.08 here. And it'll be 0 0.02 here. These three numbers, of course, have to sum to 1. So what I wrote here is the full description of, the, of P of QT given that QT minus 1 was open. I can do that for the other two conditioning states. That means I can put an arrow here, an arrow back here, arrow here. I have nine arrows, three probability distributions. These are called transition probabilities. The probability that the system will transition on the next time step to a different state, which could be the same state it's in. That's the self loop. I'd like to estimate these probabilities. I just give you examples here. I can estimate it similarly to the way I estimated it here, maybe slightly more complicated. Estimate, not the real thing. QT being a particular state, let's say state J. So the states vary over open, closed, and semi. Given that at time t minus 1, the system was in state i. 
So I and J vary over one, two, three, open, close, semi. And estimate that with Gesundheit. Count of how many times um, I have seen state I transitioning into state J in my training data divided by how many times I've seen state I transitioning into anything in my training data. This is my relative frequency estimate. You can think of other estimates, but this is my simple relative frequency estimate. Why did I write here transitioning into anything as opposed to just how many times I saw state I? Because if state I was the last state in my sequence, then I don't know what would come after it. So if I did it over a year that has 365 days, then I really don't want to count the last day of the year in the denominator because it didn't have a chance to show up in the numerator either. So given my meticulously collected data set, I can estimate probabilities of this type. Um, I might run into zeros or into the need to smooth. For example, this closed state might be rare. Might be, I don't know. If it is rare, um, it might occur here, in a especially in a particular context, uh, and even here, a very small number of times, and I might get zero. So I, need, I may need to smooth it, and I could use the Laplace method that we discussed for naive base or some other method. There's a question here. Could yeah. Could you please about the star? Like, what doesn't it count? You mentioned that it doesn't show up at the last day. Right? You want me to repeat what I said about this? Yeah. All right. Let's say my training sequence was open, 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 semi, semi, uh, closed, semi, open, open. That's it. That's my training corpus. Um, and I want to estimate how many times. I want to estimate the probability of transitioning um, from I want to estimate the probability of a time t being in state um, s given that a time t minus 1 I was in state o. The formula for that would be count of how many times I transitioned from o to s divided by count of how many times they transitioned from O to anything. So how many times they transitioned from O to S? This once, just once, right? So there would be one. Now what's my denominator? I could count how many times O occurred overall, but I really don't want to count this guy because maybe it would have transitioned to S or maybe it wouldn't. It didn't have a chance to show me, right? So I don't want to count this, the last guy. I only want to count O's that transition into something that I know what came after them. I only want to count examples that, um, that matter. I'll tell you a story, a real life story. Uh, I was doing a sabbatical in Hong Kong in 2003 when SARS hit. I remember SARS? It was pretty scary. Uh, the reason it was scary is because it very, had a very high fatality rate. Uh, of the number of people, of the people who got it, uh, many people died, even though they got very good medical care. Um, there was a lot of debate in the media about what the actual fatality rate is, and there were different estimates from different sources. Uh, there were some who, maybe they had a vested interest in playing down the fear, maybe, maybe they were just misguided, uh, estimated the fatality rate as the number of people who died divided by the number of people who got sick. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is the number of people who died divided by the number of people who got sick and either died or recovered. Right? Of the people who, who got sick but haven't yet recovered or died, we don't know if they're going to die or recover. That corresponds to the last case there. You don't include them in the denominator. This is not a small matter in an epidemic that grows exponentially the number of people who are sick right now and whose fate is not known yet is typically very large relative to the number of people who got it in the past. 
So in an epidemic that's picking up, it's a critical distinction here, it's not a big deal. It's just one, one point out of your training data. Okay, um, so we may need maybe smoothing. So we can build a first order Markov chain or first order Markov model uh, and we can estimate its parameters easily. Let me just give them names. Uh, I will call this AIJ. This is the probability of transitioning from state I to state J. And we call this the transition probabilities. Um, and uh, I will also use the big letter A as the matrix of the AIJs. So it's a matrix, um, a square matrix of n by n, where n is the number of states, in our case, three. Not much more for me to say now about Markov chains. They're very, very simple. Now the story gets complicated. You have an office mate. You don't like your office mate. Your office mate doesn't like you. So you don't talk much. But your office mate is dying to know the state of the tunnel at any one time. <laughs> but you won't tell them. But they know that you are a very orderly person. You leave home every day at exactly 8 in the morning. Now that makes the story completely unrealistic. <laughs> 10 in the morning. 10 in the morning. You leave exactly at 10. And your office mate is there in the office waiting to write down what time you arrived. <laughs> so, oh, let's leave this on. I'll just erase this. Because they know that you leave at 10 in the morning, knowing what time you arrive gives them your travel time. So let us assume that your office mate has your travel times for the entire year. These travel times could be, you know, 22 minutes, 33 minutes, 12 minutes, goes on for 365 values, rounded for simplicity to whole minutes. Now your office mate may be a very unpleasant person, but they're not stupid. They know that when the tunnel is open, will take you the least amount of time. When the tunnel is closed, will take you the most amount of time because you have to go around Wilkinsburg or wherever you go through. And when the tunnel is semi-open, it's somewhere in between. You also keep track of your travel time, of course. So you're in a better position where you already estimated transition probability matrix. You can now also attach your travel times to, um, to the state of the tunnel. So this is you. Maybe I should use a different color. I don't have a different color. Um, <laughs> do I have another color? Maybe I do. we go. White is available to your office mate. Blue is available only to you. Tunnel was open here, open here, open here, closed, semi-open, semi-open, open, closed, open. You can build a histogram for each state of the tunnel that shows the distribution of travel times under that state. So this is for state equals open, state equals closed, and state equals semi.
These are minutes or time in general. Time. T. T. And um, when the tunnel is open, the most common time of uh, arrival time or travel time is let's say 15 minutes. But there's a distribution around it, so it may look like this. When the tunnel is closed, the most common time is 30 minutes. And when it's semi-open, it's somewhere in between, let's say, 25 minutes. You have a finite sample of examples for each case. And you can build a probability estimate for travel time for each one of them. Um, you don't want to use the, uh, the um, histograms as, are, as they are because it's a small amount of data. You want to smooth it maybe. Maybe you put a Gaussian on top of it. But Gaussian is a little crazy because it will extend beyond zero and you can't travel in less than zero time. In fact, you can't realistically travel in less than five minutes, let's say. So you may want to chop it off here. Or maybe you don't smooth it, or maybe you smooth it by just you know, smoothing in a certain area. You make some kind of assumption about smoothing. It's not important to us in this case. You smooth this one, you smooth this one, and now you have something I'm going to call B. I'm going to index it with J, which is the state, and um, o, which is the observable. So I'm going to make a distinction now. Observable is what both you and your friends can see. State is what only you can see. So the state is only known to you. The observable is known to both of you. And the observable in this case is travel time. Travel time. Uh, why? Aish, but I do need to use O because it's observable. Can we use like so hat? Uh, o, so I will, this is open. Open. I really like to reserve O for observable because that's a common notation. This is the probability of travel time. being O conditioned on travel time on day ah. I use time here, I use T there, not good. Um, I'll just call it travel time. Or just travel. Travel, it's oh, minutes, I'll call it minutes, minutes, minutes. My apology. Minutes. Minutes. Q sub t on a particular day t, so t was our index for day, was j. So this is this j. This index over b is index over the three states of the tunnel, open, closed, semi. And the travel time is how many minutes it took me to travel on that day. What is the probability of it taking me this many, ta this many minutes, given that I'm in this state? Being that you have possession of your data, and you have the labels, the states, for all your data, and you have the travel time, it is a simple matter for you to derive not only the transition probabilities that we derived here, but also these probabilities, which we're going to call emission probabilities. Um, emission is one M. Emission probabilities. These are, in this case, three different probability distributions, each one of them over however many minutes are reasonable. I will take these three Bs and put them into a single, um, and I should make this also blue because this is available only to you, right? 
B is going to be the set of Bs. So this is not necessarily a matrix. This is a array of n different probability distributions. Each probability distribution is over in some specified set of possible values, number of minutes it takes you to travel. Now let's go back to your friend. Your friend knows that the tunnel has three states and that any one state can follow any other state. It doesn't know which state was in effect on any one day. He also doesn't know this and he doesn't know this. Because to, to derive these, you use your knowledge of, the, your specific knowledge of what happened on each, one, each day. But your friend is still able to derive an estimate of these and from it to be able to determine on any one day how likely the tunnel is to be open, how likely it is to be closed, and to answer other questions like given the amount of time it took you to travel until today, how long, what is the expected amount of time it will take you to travel tomorrow. So they, they, should, they will be able, after I show you how to do that, your friend will be able to, in a sense, decode or decipher the things that you didn't tell them. And they're going to do it from the observations only. Something about these observations, you will notice that they overlap. This is 15 here, this is 25, and 30 here. If you put them one on top of the other, they overlap. This is an important feature. If they didn't overlap at all, we will not have a problem. If the amount of time it takes you to travel um, when the tunnel is closed is two, more than two hours, and it never takes more than two hours when the tunnel is open, then your friend has as much information as you do, in a sense, because if it took you more than two hours, they know the tunnel was closed. If it took you 20, 12 minutes, they know it's open. It is this overlap of the observables that is giving us the trouble. If it took you, say, 20 minutes, the tunnel could have been open, it could have been semi-open, it could have been closed. That's one observation. The second observation is that knowing that this is a first order Markov chain is important. I'll give you an example. Suppose it took you, um, suppose um, you, know, you know from this that once the tunnel closes, it stays closed for a long time. Repairs take much more than a day. They never take a day. They take, or hardly ever, they take 10 days, 15 days. Um, and then you see a set of arrival times that are 10 minutes, very short. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. All of a sudden you see 22 minutes and then 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes again. If you saw the 22 minutes in isolation, you might suspect it's because the tunnel is closed or semi-closed. But because you saw it in a sequence, a very long sequence of very short arrival time, now you have reason to think that maybe it's just an aberration. Maybe the tunnel was still open, but it just happened to take longer, namely that you're in this tail here. It's open, but it happened to take longer. Maybe there was a jam or something. So this is the two sources of information we have. One is that each state has its own distribution of observables, but they overlap. That's where the problem comes in. And the second source of information is we don't know for sure on any one day what the state of the tunnel is, but there are some sequences of tunnel states that are more likely than others. And specifically, there are some that are unlikely. It is unlikely, in my example, that it's open, 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 and then it's closed for just one day and then open, open again. So this is where this comes in. The A versus the B. <coughs> Questions so far? Yeah? Why is the second assumption necessary? 
Because if you didn't have the second assumption, and you would instead assume that every day the tunnel has the same probability of being open, closed, or semi-closed, that's what we call the zero order Markov assumption, right? And in that case, uh, a sequence of 12 minutes, 12 minutes, 12 minutes, followed by 25 minutes, followed by 12 minutes, the most likely explanation of this would be open, 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 closed, open, open, <coughs> open. I'm just giving you the hand-waving explanation now. We will do the, the math in a minute. Under the first, under the zero order Markov model, zero Markov model, this is the most likely explanation. Under the first order Markov model, which is what we're going to be sticking with, the most likely explanation is that it's open throughout the time, including here. Because it is unlikely that you transition, it is not unlikely that you transition from open to close, but it's unlikely that you will immediately transition from close to open. Maybe because the transition close to open is going to be very, very small. Not a great example, I realize now, because if it's small, it would be small. No, that would still work. That would still work. So you, you take a hit by maybe by both coming here and leaving here, both of them. So there is going to be a trade-off between what is more likely by looking at the transition probabilities and what is more likely by looking only at the observables. We're going to have to balance the two against one another. So the situation you are in, you versus your friend, the situation you are in is called the Markov model. And you don't even need to bother with the arrival times because you know tunnel states. So the model, Markov model is defined without observables. The states are observed, so you don't need to distinguish observables. The situation your friend is in, your so-called friend, since you're not really friends, um, is called the hidden Markov model because they are assuming that there's a hidden set of states that is not available to them because they don't talk to you, but there are some observables that are available to them and they want to use these observables in a variety of ways. One way is to estimate these A's and B's from their observables. And the second one is once they estimated the A's and B's, given the particular new sequence of arrival, they want to be able to tell you what was the state of the tunnel on any one of those days. Decode, decrypt the state of the tunnel. Find the hidden state of the tunnel. That's the hand-waving part. I'll switch now to the wiggly math part. Question. I'm sorry? Um, no. So... On the x-axis, we have uh, the number of minutes it took to travel. On the y-axis, we have frequency or count. How often, how many days during the year um, you traveled exactly, for the travel time was exactly 15 minutes? HMMs have a lot of notation associated with them, a lot of letters. You saw the Latin letters, soon we're going to see the Greek letters. So this is why I try to um, first give you the intuition behind it, and then hopefully you can find the mapping to the le letters. The other thing I can tell you is that it takes a while to absorb them all. So the more times you read about them, see them, hear about them, the better. Um, maybe I'm just talking about my experience. It took me a while, 
years ago to fully get um, how the algorithms work. Um, it helps to teach. When you teach, you kind of find, find that you realize that you don't really understand it, and then you go back. Um, so I'm just warning you in advance. This is probably going to be somewhat more complicated than um, what we've seen in the class so far. And the best advice I can give you is just go at it again. Different explanations, different people find explanations online and so forth. I try to do the hand waving, uh, which is kind of hard to get um, uh, from text, but you can search the text yourself. All right. Uh, it would help if I plug it in, I think. Okay, so now we formalize it a little more, but I try to stick to the same notation. Um, a Markov model, this is still not the hidden Markov model, a Markov model has a set of states. You can number them from zero, you can number them from one. In this case, they're numbered from zero, so they have n plus one states. Um, and it has transition probabilities, which, because it's a first order Markov model, they depend only on the state one time step back, okay? Uh, and we call these um, transition probabilities A, J, I's here. So this is the Markov assumption here. The probability at time T depends on the, the state at any time only by, by its dependence on the last state. And we call it A, J, I. I called it A, I, J. So what A, J, I is, it's the same thing. So the way to think about it is it's the transition from the state of the first index to the state of the second index. So this is from J to I. I wrote on the board I to J. Don't let it confuse you. Uh, it's not the I or J that matters. It's which index is first and which index is second. So by convention, the first index transitioning into the second index. Um, and you have a picture here, an example of two states called A and B, and they're fully connected. So from A, you can go in the next time step to A itself, or you can go to B and vice versa. This is all there is to say about a Markov model. A hidden Markov model is an extension of a Markov model, where in addition to the set of states and to the transition probabilities, we have the observables given by O here. In this case, um, the observables are discrete. Uh, in our example, they were also discrete because I told you that we will round them to whole minutes. But just keep in mind that the observable could also be continuous. We could keep track of time as a continuous variable or it could be something else that's continuous. Um, either one would work fine. In this case, they're discrete. Um, and the observable, the probability distribution over all possible observables depends only on the state you are in right now. Which means we have as many, B, as many Bs as there are states, and each B is a distribution over all possible observables. Here are observables, there are M of them. They have a certain distribution under state A and a different distribution under state B. And if you look at the histograms here, they overlap such that you got a particular observable you don't know, it could have come from state A, it could have come from state B. If you lump together the transition probabilities and the emission probabilities, you get a fully defined hidden Markov model. And now, there are three things you may want to do with a hidden Markov model. Let me start from, um, let me give up on this. You can look at it online. Let me go back to the, um, to the board.
Let me talk about the three things you might want to do. I'm not going to list them in the same order there in, on the slide. I'm going to list them in the order in which I want to discuss them. Okay? So the first thing you might want to do, suppose somebody handed you a hidden Markov model. So given A and B, remember this is the transition matrix, N by N, when N is number of states, this is the emission um, matrix or list of probability distributions. I'll give it the whole thing a name. Lambda. Lambda is the entire HMM. Entire first order hidden Markov model. It consists of, um, to be more um, uh, rigorous, it consists of first defining a set, S, of states, including N, the number of states in it, and then A and B, transition matrix and emission probabilities. And given new observables, new observable sequence, O1 through OT, Decode this sequence. So this is as if your your friend, you were you used to be good friends, and you gave you shared all of your statistics with them, and they have your full um, information, your full A and B. But now you stop talking with them, and now they give uh, you, they only observe the arrival times, and they have to decode whether the tunnel was open or closed. So given all of this. Decode the hidden state sequence. State sequence corresponding to this one, call it Q1 to QT. Mathematically, this would be. Uh, I'll, I'll use the notation that the big Q is a sequence of little Q. So the winning hidden state sequence is the one that will maximize for all possible state sequences Q the probability of that state sequence given the model and the observable. Let's get familiar with this terminology. The big letters, big O, is this sequence. Q is this sequence. And lambda, I could put two bars here because it consists of this matrix and this kind of matrix. matrix. So what we have here is, given the model and given observables, figure out the most likely state sequence. Now when I say decode, it might be too strong of a word. Decode kind of implies that you figure out the truth. You won't be able to figure out the truth. What you could figure out is what's most likely to be the truth. These are, of course, not the same thing. My favorite example is, if each one of you buys a lottery ticket, and I buy two lottery tickets, who's the most likely person to win the lottery? I am. Am I likely to win the lottery? No. Okay? So most likely doesn't equal likely. And what we're doing here is just likely. I'm sorry, it's just most likely. It doesn't mean that we're going to get the truth here, because there are many, many possible sequences we're going to find the one sequence that is most likely according to the model and the observation, but it doesn't mean that it's the right one. In fact, it's quite, quite likely that it's not the right one. 
If everybody in the country buys a lottery ticket and I buy two lottery tickets, I'm extremely unlikely to be the winner, even though I'm the most likely person to be the winner. All right, so this is called the decoding problem. Um, I won't give the number so I don't confuse you with the slides. I'll just call it a decoding. Here's another problem called the evaluation problem. Oh, I was being a little cutesy. So a single hat is a vector. Okay. So a matrix is a vector of vectors, so I put double hat. So that explains the double hat on A. Now B is a vector of probability distributions. If the probability distributions is over discrete space, a discrete finite space, then it's a vector of vectors. So it's also a matrix. So now A is a matrix with two bars and B is a matrix with two bars. So I just felt lambda deserved two bars too. Maybe three, it's an it's a array of two matrices. Um, it doesn't have any meaning except to remind you that this lambda stands for a lot of probabilities, a lot of parameters. Okay. Sorry, I kind of glossed over that. Okay, evaluation problem. This is the decoding problem. The evaluation problem starts almost exactly the same as the decoding problem. It says, given a model, a fully specified model, and a new observable sequence O. So it starts exactly, uh, do I put a bar here? Nah, I won't put a bar here. Given a fully specified model and an observable sequence big O, so it starts exactly the same as the decoding problem, calculate the probability of O given the model. Now I feel compelled to put two bars everywhere. I'll put bar, one bar sometimes. It means the same thing. Um, it's basically saying, given an observable sequence, how likely is it to come from this model? Why would anybody need that? The answer is, we usually don't need that. We only need it as an intermediate calculation to solve something else. So there's no real world usage for it, usually. There is definitely real world usage for the decoding problem. If you build a hidden Markov model and you get some observables, you may want to know the most likely hidden state sequence that it came from. But to know the probability of some observables, if they already occurred, you may not care what the probability is. They occurred already. But we're going to solve it anyway. Um, let me rewrite this. as summation over the probability of the observable and the, the unknown, the uh, hidden state sequence, all given the model. This is just the law of total probability. These observations, observables came from some hidden state sequence, I don't know which, I have to sum over all of them. This is our second problem. Our third problem is gonna be the hardest of all. Our third problem is the learning problem, that's the one that I promised you your friend will have to do. If you're only told how many states there are, and the fact that every state can connect to all other states, and you're only given the observables over maybe a very long sequence or maybe many, many sequences that so you can concatenate together to one long sequence, can you derive an estimate for the model itself, for the A's and the B's? And the maybe surprising answer is that you can. It's only an estimate, it's not gonna be the truth, but it might be, under some circumstances, a good estimate. 
So the third problem is called the learning problem. Given only n, it's a number of states. So this time you're not given the full model. And an observable, observable sequence, O1 through OT. Estimate an HMA model. Estimate is another word for learn, right? HMM model, lambda. So estimate the transition matrix and the emission matrix. One thing that's missing in the math is that this T is typically much, much bigger than this T. Namely, in our example, if you are given the model, you might be given one week of data and be asked to decipher what one week of arrival times, and you have to decipher what was the state of the tunnel every day of that week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way through Sunday. It's a small, small set of observables, you just decode it. You might be given a whole month, or you might be given a week, or you might be given two days. If you're going to learn the model, you should be given at least a year, if not more. So even though we use the same notation, keep in mind that for learning, you need a lot more data than for decoding. For decoding, you can decode any length sequence. Okay? So the two practical things you need to do with HMMs is learn them and use them. Learn is the learning problem. You learn them from observables only, without knowing what the underlying hidden state sequences, and using them is decoding, figuring out the most likely hidden state sequence for a new, new observable sequence. On the way, you may want to solve the evaluation problem as a useful intermediate. Yeah? Could you give a use case for the decoding problem? Like the learning problem is the observer trying to figure out the actual state. How, how does this figure out in the real world? Not the true state, so it's really important to make a distinction between true state and the model parameters. What you're figuring out here is the model parameters. What you're figuring out in the decoding is given model parameters, the most likely hidden state of the system that correspond to something you observed. So this is a very good segue into why it's called the hidden Markov model. It's called hidden not because the parameters are unknown. This is a common misconception. The parameters can be well known. A and B, the transition and emission probabilities can be well known. It's still a hidden Markov model. The reason it's called hidden is that when it operates, when it describes a system, the state of the system at any one time is hidden from you. What is observable to you is only the observables, the arrival times. You can be in a situation where the, pro the model is not known to you, in which case you have to use the learning process to learn it, to estimate it from data, or you can be in a situation where the model is known to you, maybe even you derived it yourself. So think of the story of you and your friend. Um, both of you are dealing with the hidden Markov model now. The difference between you is that you, as the person who actually did the travel, can estimate the transition and emission probabilities much better using relative frequency. Or you can even, let's say you have enough data that you, can, you know for sure what the transition and emission probabilities are. It's still a hidden Markov model in the sense that if, another, if you now sit in your office and another person was passing through the tunnel for a week, you still don't know what the state of the tunnel that week is. Your friend is also dealing with a hidden Markov model, but they have to estimate those parameters just from observables. So the difference between you and your friend is not in that it's hidden to one of you and not the other. The difference is that you have labeled 
data, data that was labeled with a hidden sequence, labeled training data, and therefore it's easier for you to estimate the transition and emission probabilities than it is for your friend. It's still a hidden Markov model for both of you. Right. Um, we're going to actually start with the evaluation problem, namely figuring this one out, this thing out. Repeat it here, given the model, I'm getting lazy and putting only one bar, given the model and a new observable sequence, by new I mean not something that was used to estimate the model. The model is just given to you. You're assuming that the model is correct, exactly correct. The observation sequence O, I will put a bar here. O1 to OT. What we want to calculate is the probability of this observation sequence given the model. Very simple. How would we go about it? I already hinted to it over there. I'm going to start by using the chain rule, not the chain rule, the law of total probability, to open it up as a sum of, of all possible hidden state sequences. So when I observe some observable sequence, it could have come from, in principle, from any possible hidden state sequence. So I have to sum over all of them, because I don't really care in this particular problem what the hidden state sequence is, I just want to know what the probability of seeing these particular observables is. Now the reason I write it this way is because I know how to calculate something like this. For a particular hidden state sequence, for me to be able to see a particular hidden state sequence followed by a particular observable, so let's say Q time T time 1, Q time 2, Q time 3, all the way to Q at time big T with O of time 1, O of time 2, all the way to O of time T, I need to transition from state 1 to state 2 from state 2 to state 3, 3 to 4, and so forth. And while I'm in state Q1, I have to em emit an observable O1, here O2, and so forth. This is a graphic model representation of an HMM, of a first order hidden Markov model. Uh, maybe I should write it a little bit bigger. Q1. Oh! Didn't realize we're out of time. Thank you for reminding me. Um, my, my request to you is go over the slides, go over the paper that's linked to online, go over any other source. The more you see the stuff, the easier it would be to get. And don't get overwhelmed, it'll eventually fall into place.